This video was brought to you by Ground News. Hello friends, my name is JJ, and today I want to talk to you about three important Canadian holidays and the various ways they've become contentious or controversial in recent years, and what this in turn reveals about some of the challenges of modern Canadian identity and culture. So we'll look at Canadian Thanksgiving, which embodies some of Canada's anxieties about the United States, Canadian Remembrance Day, which provokes division about war and veterans, and Canada Day, which increasingly serves as a flashpoint for polarized opinions about Canadian history. So let's start with Canadian Thanksgiving, which is celebrated on the second Monday in October. In many ways, I would say that this is the most culturally confused holiday on the Canadian calendar, because it is a sort of muddled embodiment of Canada's inability to decide just how American it wants to be. So this idea of an official day of Thanksgiving was originally a somewhat generic English custom. The king or parliament would issue a proclamation telling everyone to literally give thanks in the aftermath of some important event. This custom carried over into the New World, and in fact continued here long after it ceased to be a thing in England itself. In both the United States and Canada, legislatures would pass resolutions of Thanksgiving whenever something significant happened. Abraham Lincoln started the tradition of issuing a general decree of gratitude every year, but it still took a while before this concept evolved into a holiday in the sense we'd understand it today. In fact, according to this excellent New Yorker essay on the history of Thanksgiving, it wasn't until the early 20th century that American Thanksgiving was transformed into the patriotic founding of America holiday of contemporary fame. As author Philip Deloria writes, After the Civil War, Thanksgiving developed rituals, foodways, and themes of family and national reunion. Only later would it consolidate its narrative around a harmonious pilgrim wampanoag Noag feast. Spreading over late 19th and early 20th century immigration, American myth makers discovered that pilgrims and New England as a whole were perfectly cast as national founders. White, Protestant, Democratic, and blessed with an American character centered on family, work, individualism, freedom, and faith. And thus, at a time when America's growing middle-class consumer economy saw holidays of all sorts get commercialized and standardized with a stable set of traditions, myths, characters, and decorations, the yearly day of Thanksgiving was reborn as a holiday centering around a sentimentalized commemoration of the arrival of the English pilgrims on the Mayflower and their so-called first Thanksgiving with the Wampanoag Indians. By the late 19th century, the concept of a yearly Thanksgiving day had become common in Canada Canada as well, as had the idea of a big Thanksgiving dinner with a lot of stereotypically North American foods in celebration of the riches of this continent. But adding a historic motif to the mix seems to have been a bridge too far for the Canadians, and to this day there is a marked resistance in this country to embracing the whole pilgrims and Indians theme of the holiday. That resistance has nothing to do with the obviously BS nature of the legend, but rather a deeper Canadian bias towards rejecting American history as something irrelevant and foreign. I mean, I think you could very easily make the case that the arrival of the English pilgrims to Massachusetts is more a part of a shared North American history than just US history per se. To the extent the Mayflower represents any sort of important turning point in the British settlement of this continent, it's obviously relevant to Canada too. But emphasizing Canada's distinct history has always been an important part of Canadian nationalism, thus making it inevitable that any holiday traditions to too overtly about American history would be shunned here. Anyway, the end result is that Canadian Thanksgiving has today become a fairly bland sort of holiday with no real narrative or lore justifying it, which means few decorations and no cartoons or school plays or parades or any of the other stuff that has helped build up its reputation in the US. In fact, I would go so far as to say most Canadians really have no idea of what their version of Thanksgiving is even supposed to be celebrating, which can give it a bit of a going through the motions vibe and a mythologizing of American Thanksgiving as something really epic by comparison. My father used to always say, you know, in America, Thanksgiving is bigger than Christmas. And everyone would nod because that's the kind of thing Canadians believe. But Canadian Thanksgiving does have one thing going for it. It's celebrated on a different day than American Thanksgiving. And simply doing an American thing in a way that is slightly different than what is done in America is usually enough to give something a sense of meaning in Canada. All right, next holiday we're gonna talk about 
is Remembrance Day, November 11th. So the First World War was the biggest war that Canadians had ever participated in, as Britain mobilized its overseas colonies to fight its European enemies. Over 60,000 Canadians were killed, and the amount of death and destruction that the war caused famously helped make much of the world regard war as something inherently horrible and traumatizing, as opposed to normal or glamorous. In 1919, the year after the war ended, the British government decreed that there should be a national day of remembrance across the empire for fallen soldiers. On the 11th of November, the day that peace was officially declared, Britain played an active role promoting an empire-wide standard for how the war's memory should be commemorated, with traditions and symbols that encouraged the public to regard the men who had fought for king and country as brave but tragic heroes and to focus on the selflessness of their sacrifice more than what the war was actually about. A hundred years later, it is quite striking to observe just how many of Canada's Remembrance Day traditions continue to be bound up in these World War I era imperial customs. Poppies, white crosses, the poem Flanders Fields, the laying of wreaths at enormous lest we forget monuments. These were all part of a certain suite of early 20th century traditions designed to make Canadians think about war in a very particular way. And from this, a couple of contemporary controversies have arisen. One is the argument that much of Canada's Remembrance Day regime simply glorifies war by emphasizing a certain kind of old-fashioned sentimentality about it, rather than, say, encouraging a reflection on the politics that lead to it. In some corners of the political left, activists have accordingly been trying to get Canadians to stop wearing poppies around Remembrance Day, or to make white poppies a thing, and thereby reject the supposed war apologia that the red poppy tradition supposedly represents. Expand their focus on Remembrance Day to include also uh, the civilians who are estimated to make up over 90% of the victims of contemporary war, and to question whether war is really an effective means of uh, resolving uh, conflicts. This movement, in turn, has been greatly exaggerated by a lot of Canadians on the right, who have made fighting this supposed war on poppies into this big culture war thing in order to demonstrate how much they support the troops. It's a sense. I live in Mississauga. Nobody wears, uh, uh, very few people wear uh, a poppy. You people love, you, you they come here, whatever it is, you love our way of life, you love our milk and honey, at least you could pay a couple of bucks for poppies or something like that. On Saturday, Cherry implied immigrants can't be bothered to wear poppies for Remembrance Day. Sportsnet announced Cherry is stepping down effective immediately. Which leads to the other controversy, which is the idea that Canada's Remembrance Day traditions have contributed to a rather frozen in time understanding of Canadian military sacrifice. The sentimentality of Rune Canada's contribution to World War I was extended to World War II, but it often feels like Canada's Remembrance Day culture has mostly remained static since then. And as these wars become more distant, this culture of remembrance cannot help but become more and more backwards looking, more obsessed with old history, old traditions, old men, old things in general. A lot of this manifests through the Royal Canadian Legion, an organization founded after World War I that plays a prominent role in putting on Remembrance Day events across Canada. The Legion remains obsessed with a very old school aesthetic, which will be well known to anyone who's ever visited the Legion Hall. It communicates an idea that veteran culture is old people culture, with the old people who run the Legion increasingly just patriotic history fans, divorced from the concerns of the modern Canadian armed forces. Here is how author and veteran Robert Small described it in a 2016 editorial. Just how open is the Legion's door to non-veterans? These military wannabes can wear the Legion uniform and occupy leadership positions right up to the highest command levels, making decisions and advising government on behalf of actual military veterans. They're also entitled to wear the Legion's own merit medals, which trusting, inexperienced members of the public often mistake for real military decorations. You do not have to serve in the military to earn them. According to the Legion, it is an uphill battle to reach out to younger generations of veterans. And of course, Canada has lots of young veterans, men and women who served in the long Afghanistan war or other overseas deployments. But so long as Canada's dominant understanding of military service remains so bound up in nostalgia, 
they have far less influence over Remembrance Day culture than they probably should. Before I move on to holiday number three, let us now just hear a word from today's video sponsor, Ground News. So living as we do in the age of the 24 seven news cycle, it can be quite difficult to process the endless fire hose of headlines that social media is spraying at us from every angle. For this reason, I have long been a fan of news aggregator apps that help make your news consumption more efficient, so you don't have to rely on 16 different breaking news apps blowing up your phone at all hours of the day. And I gotta say, the exciting new Canadian-made news app, Ground News, is one of the best I've seen in a while. It combines many of the best aspects of some of the other news aggregator apps I've used in the past, but also adds several unique key features. The best one is this little bar they put at the bottom of major headlines to let you know if a story is playing mostly in the left-wing press or the right-wing press. So for example, you can see that this story about the Biden administration shipping vaccines overseas has gotten more coverage in liberal outlets, while this story about the state of Oklahoma suing over vaccine mandates has been more covered by the right. With Ground News's blind spot sorting feature, you can even see some of the most extreme examples of select Active coverage in practice. When you're attempting to understand modern politics, it is really important to grasp the degree that people's opinions are formed by the news sources they rely on. So features like these can really help highlight some of the root causes of our polarized political climate these days, and maybe even help correct for some biases of your own. Anyway, it is a very sophisticated and very free app for serious news junkies with a ton of customizable features that I'm sure you guys will really enjoy. Just visit ground.news slash JJ or click on the link in the thing below and get started today. All right, now let us talk about Canada Day. So July 1st is Canada's national holiday, the sort of all-purpose patriotic day that most countries have in some form or another. It was originally known as Dominion Day, in acknowledgement of the fact that it was the day that the modern constitution of Canada was adopted, which established Canada as a self-governing dominion of the British Empire. And according to the city of Barkerville, British Columbia, which claims to have invented the idea of celebrating this anniversary back in 1868. The initial goal was to create a holiday akin to Independence Day in the United States. But despite Barkerville's best efforts, for a long time, Dominion Day was not really much of a thing. At one time, there was actually a thinking in Canada that it was un-British to celebrate a national holiday. The big change is usually said to have come on the 100th anniversary of the Canadian Constitution in 1967, which was celebrated with a huge party in Ottawa as as well as at the Montreal World's Expo, which was happening at the same time. It was a year that modeled and normalized a kind of over-the-top patriotic celebration, which has been the mainstream way to celebrate July 1st ever since. It was in the post-67 era that the idea of calling this rejuvenated holiday Canada Day became more mainstream as well. There had been talk of changing the name since at least the 1940s, given the term Dominion had become a sort of old fashioned word that sounded too generic and colonial, but it wasn't until 1983 that it officially changed. For the last 50 or so years, I think you can confidently say that Canada Day celebrations have been among the highlights of the summer season for many Canadians with fireworks and barbecues and all the rest. But in more recent times, a lot of Canadians don't seem to know if they're all that interested in being quite so patriotic about Canada anymore. In some corners of the right wing, there are those who think that Canada has become far too diverse and multicultural in recent years, and that this country has slowly abandoned much of the specifically Anglo-Saxon culture that once so aggressively defined it. Pretty much every Canada Day now reliably sees some right-wing people come out and make a, frankly, a historic claim that Canada Day was changed from Dominion Day as part of some postmodern leftist plot to rob the Anglo-Canadians of their heritage. A lot of Canadians do not really know the history of this country very well, and so as more people come to feel alienated from the political and cultural divisions that define Canada in the present, there can be a tendency to fantasize about some imagined past in which the country was more united, and perhaps the social standing of certain types of people were a bit less contested than they are now. But then on the other side, you have people on the left who believe just the opposite, and increasingly see Canada as a country defined by a history of racism, colonialism, and genocide. This too, I would argue, is partially a reaction to dealing with some of the challenges of modern Canada, and an attempt to find explanations for some of the serious 
various social problems plaguing this country, particularly inequalities of power and wealth between different racial groups. The severe social problems of the indigenous Canadians in particular has become a subject of deep shame and political attention for at least the last 30 years or so. And this was accelerated last year in the aftermath of a growing anti-racism movement in the US, and more recently, the discovery of previously unknown graves at former Indian residential schools across Canada. When Canada Day came around last July, many progressives, including Prime Minister Trudeau, suggested that maybe we should perhaps start regarding the holiday in more of a somber way, as a day for grappling with Canada's dark past rather than just celebrating its present. We, as Canadians, must be honest with ourselves about our history. Because in order to chart a new and better path forward, we have to recognize the terrible mistakes of our past. You started to see the slogan, no pride in genocide in more places, including at this guy's condo in my parents' middle-class neighborhood. Now this too, of course, can sometimes be ahistoric. Again, a lot of Canadians just don't know that much about Canadian history, which I think can sometimes make them a bit overly credulous about even the most sensationalistic or hyperbolic allegations about Canada's past, just because sometimes when you don't know much, you will believe anything. But for good or ill, this is undeniably a powerful faction in modern Canadian culture, and thus a modern reality affecting Canada Day. So one thing that often strikes me whenever I make videos like this about cultural traditions is just how new so many of them are. I think we often assume that holidays in particular are these really ancient things, but as we've hopefully seen, in Canada at least, a lot of them are actually quite recent things that were developed in response to specific cultural needs of the 20th century. And now, as we move deeper into a new century, it becomes more or less inevitable that we would begin a process of revisiting some of these traditions and the assumptions behind them. Let me know which one of these three holidays you think are most deserving of criticism or reevaluation, or if you prefer, which ones do you think are facing the most overblown backlash? Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to check out Ground News, and I will see you all next week.